Hey everyone, welcome to Around the Kitchen Table with my co-host Susan Sarah and our special guest Rhonda Kanucky. I think I said that right. And, Excellent. Uh, good. And today we're going to make for you something that speaks of summer to me. And uh, when I make this in the winter time, well, in Florida there is no winter time anymore, so that doesn't matter. But up north, when I thank used, you. Yeah, when I used to make it in the winter. It was always like a breath of fresh air, uh, bringing the basil out, making pesto, and tossing it with with something. You know, it was just um, just a great way to talk about summer that's coming and how to use some of those wonderful greens you have out in the market. Because you can make pesto just about out of anything leafy and green. So, and we're going to show you how to do one variation of that today. Uh, but right now, I want to say hi to Susan. Susan, it's good to see you. Hi. Good to see you too, Chef. Did you have a good weekend? Absolutely. You know, uh, we had some rain here and there. Uh, not quite biblical rain, but it was getting close Sunday. And uh, But other than that, the sun was out for a good part of the day, and we haven't hit the humidity yet. And I preface that with yet. Uh, so it's coming. I know. You keep saying that. And, I'm, and the way I look at it, your summer is really our winter. There you go. I would imagine, except except that you could take a dip in the water anytime you want so yeah, yeah, yeah we, we can't, can't we quite can do that yeah. but you know I I had a good weekend I went to yesterday I went to the farmers market it was the first uh, time this spring our local farmers market was open and do you have farmers you must have farmers markets nearby you know we had one that was open when we moved here which is maybe two three miles away at the most and it hasn't opened back up it closed right after Christmas and we're patiently waiting for it to open up. It's right across from one of the, we, you know, there's cattle ranches on the way to where we live. It's just insane. And then, you know, you're not that far from downtown, too. Uh, but it, that's the closest one. And no, we really don't. You know, they have uh, Celebration has uh, a thing on Sundays. It's a market and a farmer's market. And uh, Kissimmee has this little tiny one that's like uh, maybe about 10 booths. But, you know, not as much or to the extent close to me as when I was in Jersey. But if you drive into Orlando, holy moly, there's a farmer's market or Winter Gardens, there's a farmer's market to end all farmer's markets. And, and how far are you from Orlando? Uh, to go to the farmer's market in Orlando would probably take me about 40 minutes. Okay, is, all right, so it's not around the corner. No, it, it's not a terrible drive. You know, they're going to build the sun rails coming down. We, they did the first stage of sun rail. Wow. The station right near our house, you know, within uh, a mile at that. And Winter Garden, Winter, Gar Winter Park. Winter Park, Winter Garden, Lisa? What? Which one do we go to, Winter Park? Winter Park. Winter Park. I always get them mixed up, and one time I drove to the wrong one when I had a meeting, so it was a bad thing. Oh, gee. <laughs> I hate when that happens. Yeah, and it was 35 minutes away, so it wasn't a good thing. No, but we have we have such a nice one. There's so many um, booths, and they come from the. Uh, I'm about an hour outside of uh, New York City, actually, at specifically around 37 miles. Although it could be two hours, you never know with traffic. So we're in the, the suburb of, of the North Shore of Long Island, and um, they closed down, I think, in November. They just opened, and we have booths that come from upstate New York, from the east end of Long Island, and a, a lot of, like, organic type of, um, you know, uh, small artisanal providers, whatever. So we bought some. I saw this. Uh, oh, I mean, all kinds of words like sustainable, organic, free range, no this, no that in terms of hormones and everything. So I figured, well, that must be good and it'll make me live longer. So I bought a bunch of meat and, um, and they had a freezer truck that they go into to pick the meat. So everything's frozen. When And I, I bought, what did I buy? Brisket, I bought steaks, I bought, I don't know, but a whole bunch of, I think pork and beef. I don't know, Dennis. The beef is is like this maroon color. <laughs> it's this dark, dark maroon. It looks like I, it looks like nothing I've ever seen. It's like a blue red. Yeah. Yep. You know what I'm talking about? I do. That's that's. Uh, we're just so programmed into seeing uh, meat that's been injected and you know other things added to it so it has that happy red color that we're all familiar with 
uh, but that that like bluish red. Yeah. You know, a lot of times what you see on on the good cuts of meat or the meat that has not been processed quite as much as we're used to seeing. But you know, you put that in a supermarket, people will walk away from it. So uh, tell me about it. I thought, oh boy, what am I in for? So we haven't had it yet, but um, you know, if, if I'm sure it's going to be terrific, I look forward to it. And then that's it. We can just have it for the rest of the season. So, so that was kind of interesting. The one thing you uh, you need to watch with some of it is. And, and not always, but a lot of times that kind of meat is not as fat, which is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because you're not getting all that extra fat that you don't need, but it's a bad thing because fat adds flavor and fat makes it tender. So, you know, that's that's something, you know, it keeps it from drying out. So that could be a good thing and a bad thing. Depending on yeah, that. you're right about that. There wasn't much, there wasn't much fat, so we'll see what happens. And they sell out, they sell out so fast in terms of the vegetables, so you really have to go there like 8, 8.30 in the morning, so I think I'm going to start doing that. But I'm so thrilled you're making this today because I campaigned for it, and, you know, after a long winter, I, I want my pesto, and I'm going to play Stump the Chef because... <laughs> So many questions about it, and then later I'm going to play stump, uh, stump the other kitchen designer. We have with us Rhonda Kanucky, okay. and she. Hi, Rhonda, and yeah. Rhonda is. Um, she has more initials than I do, and I'm very proud of my initials, but she has more. She says C M C M B K D C M B K D. Yeah, she has the bath. Right, right. She has the bath uh, certification that I don't because I'm all about kitchens and I only do baths under protest. So uh, Rhonda has the whole deal. And uh, so Rhonda and I, then I'm going to play Stump Rhonda. And I have a whole bunch of images. And you know, the mixer has to go somewhere on the countertop. Uh, and sometimes it's a problem and sometimes it's there and it's taking up space and, and you don't use it. I have, let me tell you, because also I went to Milan, as you know, I have killer images and of so many options of what to do with a mixer and uh, Rhonda and I are going to play love it, hate it, or meh. We'll have the, the certifications on the wall, but we'll see if we can do the game show lightning rod today. I'm that's that's right. So, Rhonda, tell us about uh, you know about you have a you're in business um, for yourself, and you do consulting, and you do full you you execute full projects, right? I do. Um, for many many years, I worked for a design build firm, and I now do design only, but work in conjunction with general contractors, mostly kitchens and bathrooms, also whole houses, um, and really like looking at the kitchen holistically with the entire house. My mother was a caterer, uh, Chef Dennis, for 33 years, so we lived in that kitchen for 20 hours of the day. Wow. So I think that's really where I got my baptism by fire was growing up in the kitchen, literally. Um, so we were in that kitchen really about 20 hours a day. <laughs> wow. And then later as a kitchen designer, and now I'm also a certified aging in place specialist. So you see where this tier is going. Now I'm aging in place and helping others do it too. Yeah, so. that's that's terrific, and we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. So, and Chef, I live in Portland. Yep, and you're from Portland, Oregon. Right, I live in Portlandia, so we just had our big rose parade this last weekend, our annual oh. rose parade. A lot of open markets, and I just planted some fresh herbs, so I am so ready. What do you see here? Roses, oh. roses from my garden. I should have mine out, that's for sure, that's right. Yeah, and mine are just oh. coming out. Just got rose bushes for Mother's Day and birthday, and so they're blooming their little heads off, and uh, love in Portland. So you're, so you're in Portlandia like that show. Oh, I am one of the ones helping keep it weird, honey. That's definitely oh, my job. Well, then this will be Part of my job description, and that's what one of the certificates is for too. It's CMKBD, CAPS, CAPS, but also helping keep Portland weird. Love it. Love, love, love. love. Okay. Here. All right. So there we go. Good introduction. So, <laughs> Chef, you know, give me some pesto. Okay, we're ready then. We're going to start off with a classic. Uh, we're going to do pesto genovese, which you know we'll have as many interpretations as there are, you know 
days in the year. Everybody has their own little tweak on it. Uh, but I'm going to show you how I learned to make it. Oh, I hate to even think back that far how many years ago it was, but it was decades. And before pesto was really fashionable or popular or we started making anything other than uh, basil pesto, uh, it, it was the recipe that was handed down to me. And I make it that way sometimes, and other times I do make adjustments to it. But it's a good way to start and give yourself a feel for how you like it. And the difference with my pesto is I do use some Italian parsley in it, too, just to cut down a little bit of the uh, overpowering flavor that basil can have. So, I mean, you want it to be enjoyable, you want it to be tasty, but you don't want it to, to really just knock you down with the flavor. So it depends on, you know, what you're using it for, too. Uh, if you were using it with meats as a, you know, as a layer of stuffing in it or coating it with something, you might just want all the basil. Uh, but we're going to show you the way I learned to make it originally. And I'm going to start. Let me switch cameras here so you can see a little bit. We're going to start. I have my food processor up here. You know, in the old days, we used to use a mortar and a pestle. So we did not make anywhere near this much pesto at one time. But thanks to uh, modern technology, and now I'm going to load this up. This yeah. pesto. I can smell it from here. Let me tell you something. It, nothing says, like I said, nothing says summer. I worked at a restaurant for a few years that was bordering a farm, and I would come in to work sometimes, and there would be a bushel basket of uh, fresh basil sitting on my doorstep oh. at the restaurant because the farmer knew we loved it, and I would just bury my head in it and just inhale. Uh, it was just such a lovely aroma. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to start to grind this up just a little bit, then I'm going to add in. Also, mm -hmm. you tell me if this is too loud. For no, you. It's, it's pretty good. It's fine. Yeah. Probably when we start adding the pulp. All right, so I'm just getting the pulse. It's not quite ready. But now I'm going to add in some fresh Italian parsley. Oh, that's a lot. I think that's a lot. Wow. No, it's about a third. Oh, yeah, I didn't expect that much. It's about I have a third. To try that. And, you know, it can be as much as you want or as little as you want or not at all. You know, it's not a deal breaker. It's just, like I said, I really enjoy pesto. I like using a little bit more of it. And this helps keep the flavor. But you know what? You know what, Chef? I think parsley is underrated. Too often it's only used as a garnish. Oh, absolutely. Or, or you just put a little bit of it in, in foods. But I really, I think it has such a fresh taste and it deserves to be a more prominent, have a more prominent role in, in dishes, don't you think? Absolutely. You know, it, it doesn't have a real strong flavor, but it does have some flavor and it does add something to the, to the pesto. I think it, is a, it has a fresh sort of taste. Yeah. So I've added in my, uh, my basil, my pesto, and I've just ground it up a little bit. Now I'm going to add in some pine nuts. Okay. Oh, okay, pine nuts, stump the chef. Okay. Um, pine, you know what? My son, who is a foodie, uh, and his fiance, they make everything from scratch. He said to me, ask the chef what I can use that's not as expensive. We're starving college students, and, you know, what can we substitute? Walnuts. Okay. When, when you don't have pine nuts, bring out the walnuts. Okay. Uh, they'll do the same kind of thing to it. And if you want to change the flavor profile a little, experiment with some of your flavor nuts, uh, favorite nuts. You know, um, I'm going to make an arugula pesto with pistachios in a little while. So. Oh. But, you know, I would say with something a little bland, and so a walnut is a good choice. And that you, you really the nut isn't a deal breaker. You know, I know it should be in there. But if you have someone with a nut allergy, you know, leave the nuts out. It's not really going to That's be true. And yeah, we have a ton of hazelnuts here, which which blend in really nicely with a lot of things. Oh, Should you do? Would you suggest hazelnuts would probably be wonderful. You just want to watch that they don't overpower the flavor of whatever nut you're using. It is mild enough uh, that it doesn't give it too distinctive of a flavor. Although that can be an excellent thing too, because then you've got a hazelnut. Pie basil pesto, which is you. I'm writing that one down. Yeah. You know, that's what I'm saying. Don't be afraid. You know, like this is, you know, if you want to make a cilantro pesto, make a cilantro pesto. If you want to make, we're going to make an arugula. If you want to use baby kale or uh, some other leafy green, you know, you, you have to 
temper it. I mean, you can probably make something just about anything, but you have to think of what the applications of it's going to be and how it's really going to taste, the, how the flavor, flavor profiles are going to work. With so it. I think what you need, Chef, is you need a spreadsheet. <laughs> you need something to have a spreadsheet. You need a, you need a food processor and the willingness to experiment. Okay. <laughs> and take notes. So I can do both of those. <laughs> yep. So I have uh, I have some nuts in here. And I'm also going to throw in a clove of garlic. Now I don't like to use too much garlic because I don't like it to taste hot. You know I don't and garlic yes fresh garlic, yes well, too much heat to it. So that's a good sized clove, and I'm just going to pulse this up. Interesting because I I use a lot of garlic. How about you, Rhonda? Yeah, it's it's a thin line, isn't it? I put in more yeah, than line, you can't take it back out, and if you're right, if I would have never described it as a heat. That's and I'm gonna, it does. Yeah. Add in some cheese, and uh, Alexandra, Alex uh, had asked me about not using cheese, and I I had to look around. Actually, I I knew I'd heard of someone who had done that, and I found uh, someone who used. Um, Yeast, and it wasn't just regular yeast. I'm trying to remember what kind of yeast I told her, but it was one of these. Um, where the heck is it? What are you looking for? The, the nutritional yeast. Oh, oh, she I didn't. I about, missed that one. I didn't yeah, see Alex that one. I asked about uh, making it without because she's a vegan. Right. And have cheese. So, you know, my first thought was, well, I have seen soy-based vegan cheeses before, uh, you know, like uh, Romano. You know, it's not quite the same. I've never used it, so I don't know how it tastes. So I said to be careful and try it. And then I did uh, check with someone, and they had said nutritional yeast is a good substitute because it has the same flavor. So, again, you know, you have to watch what kind of amount you put in, but, you know, that could be a way to get that little... Uh, flavor into it that you like so much. Now, what do you? Okay, another stump the another stump the chef question. Uh, what do you think about adding lemon uh, to this? You could. Um, I don't know if I would. Lemon is it's not something that you can. Once you put it in, you can take it back out. If I want a little lemon with my pesto, I might put it into it when whatever application I was using it, or serve it on the side that you can do a squeeze with it. Okay, because I did see a parsley lemon. You can stone. use lemon. You can use some of the, there's different different herbs out there that they call, you know, lemon parsley or lemon basil. Uh, there's some different kinds. Oh, that's funny. Maybe that was it. So, you know, using like I have a chocolate uh, parsley. It's a chocolate parsley. No, chocolate mint out there. I mean, you could throw something like that in. You know, you can change it up uh, just by adding a little twist to it, you know, if you want to have that little like, hmm, but you want it to always be like, what's that flavor? That's really interesting. You don't want to be like, oh my god, what's that flavor? So, you know, there's a fine line between the two and you have to experiment and find it when you start adding different elements into it. Yeah, hey Chef, Shannon Steves is asking what kind of cheese are you using? I am using Pecorino Romano, which is what okay. I always use. And I buy that. Uh, it's not an expensive, overly expensive brand. I buy it uh, by a two-pound bag, and you can usually get it at a lot of your uh, big box stores. Uh, of course, you know if you want the best, you want to get Locatelli. Uh, that's the name brand of Pecorino Romano. But you know you can always use other cheeses too, as long as it's a hard, gradable cheese. Um, Grana, what is it? Grana. Uh, uh, my mind is blank. Uh, Pada, Padana, that other hard cheese, uh, Asagio. You know, it's going to change the flavor, though. So you just have to yeah. be aware. And you don't want a, a really strong cheese unless that's what you want. Again, it can be very interesting. You know, so you could change the flavor profiles that way. You can also leave the cheese out and add it into the dish that you're making. Oh, okay. So, yeah. like, I'm going to use Gorgonzola. And I, I can, you can either blend it in when I do uh, the arugula. You can either blend it in, or you can add it to the dish later. Like if you were using it as a as a coating on chicken or into a pasta, even you could just let it melt in that way. All right, so let me pause. Vegan this. recipes or restaurants um, in your parts, Susan, and 
and Chef Dennis. We have a lot of vegan restaurants here in Portland. I wonder if you had many there. Um, no, I, but I'm sure you have more than we do. A lot. Yes. Yeah. What are you doing now, Chef? I'm just pulsing it all up. I have everything in there. Okay. Okay, now, now the, the last step is, of course, uh -huh. oil. And this okay. is, is almost more to make it more easy to use, uh, to make it easier to store. And I'm just going to put oil in. And you watch it, and it'll start coming off. It'll start to form. It'll start coming off the sides a little. And you can see the liquid. You don't want it oily, but you don't want it too thick. Okay, I counted 15 seconds, so if I get a bottle like that, I could just count 15 seconds. That's a great storage and application with the uh, squirt bottle, you're right. Uh, you know, that's a chef good. thing, that's a professional chef thing. That's right, it's great. Let me show you. Something we can all use, though, and do. Yeah, alright, so you can see it's not oily. Oh, I like that. Yep. Okay. But it's wet enough. Now, the oil is also going to help uh, protect it when you store it, too. All right, so that's pesto, and that's that easy. And it's done, and I'm going to show you how to use it. I have some water on for pasta, and one of our favorite ways to use it when the pasta gets cooked. But right now, I'm going to move this to another bowl, and I'm going to wash it so we can move into our next facet because. We didn't get KitchenAid on them. They didn't send me new uh, food processors with extra bowls, so I don't have to keep washing them. Hint, hint. But <laughs> hopefully we can find them later. Uh, so why don't you guys talk a little, and I'll be back with you in a few minutes. Sure. Sounds good. Susan, so, I did see a question or two pop up on the screen here. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, take it, um, we'll take it in a little while so that the chef right. can answer it too. So, Rhonda, um, you know, I, I'm thinking about the mixer. Tell me, you know, small appliances, when we plan kitchens, you really have to consider that, uh, where where it's going to go. That what, what type of questions do you ask your clients about, I about, about, about small, small appliances? Sure. It's really, truly a, a category. I call small appliances right down the checklist because everybody has um, either you're kind of anti-small gadget or even if they consider themselves pretty minimalist let's do the list shall we and you get the pencil out and there's always a few more than than they think of so um, oftentimes daily habits you know what's out all the time sometimes coffee maker sometimes the toaster um, oftentimes I have clients that do daily uh, we have a lot of juicers here so a lot of juicers and uh, veggie drinks and so forth. So the blender, food processors, mixers, mm. and that, that list starts to add up. So if there's things like pasta makers not used as much, different kind of storage, different kind of application as a designer, wouldn't you say? Oh, definitely. And, you know, I, there's always the balance. It's like peeling the layer off. What is a habit and what is a true desire or need? And sometimes you have to you know talk talk our clients through it and just because they've had it there uh, you know forever and they may not uh, you know use it and then they they'll think oh well either they'll want it there or not a good example is in my other house I had double ovens uh, you know double ovens good sized kitchen double ovens Rhonda I use the second oven one day a year and that was Thanksgiving, but you know what? I was happy I had it. I was happy I had it. So in the case of a KitchenAid mixer, it's very heavy. You know, people, you know, people don't always use what they tuck away, right? Well, and the opposite is true. We have it out when we shouldn't or don't need it. And by the same token, there are things that we would use more often, like a food processor, if it was just a little handier. So while people love walk-in pantries, it does take a little effort, and sometimes you go, eh, you know, I'll just grab a knife and get to it. But if it's handier, like anything, we'll use it. 
Yeah, that's true. You know, I have some images here. I'm going to go through a few. And okay. Chef, if you can hear me, just tell me when when you're ready to take over again. So I'm going to do a screen share, and I want you. Are you ready? No, we're fine. Keep oh, going. Okay, good. So Rhonda, you're going to tell me love it, hate it, good idea, or ah, eh, you know. Thumbs so, up or thumbs down, huh? Okay. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. So here we go. Okay, so first image is a kitchen, black kitchen. Now what I like is that you, you have the shelf, which is a little bit deeper. Now I'm not sure how deep that is. It may it may be a little too shallow, but what, what do you think if that shelf were say nine inches? Could you see putting a mixer there or would it be too, would it ruin the vibe? I don't know that I'd do a mixer there because ergonomically it's going to keep raising the, the height of the work, working wall cabinets, but I had lived in a previous house uh, with a six inch deep console shelf that all those small things that you see on that counter is a great example um, are up and off your counter. So a console shelf, as the Europeans remind us, we waste it. It's 18 inches of primo yes. ergonomic yes. space and we throw it out the window. So utility rack, small console shelf like this, I think is a good way to put that. Extra yeah, I think so too, and it look it really looks great too. I'm going to move on to the next one. Here is a very contemporary kitchen, and we see a mixer which looks very retro. Uh, you know, just at the end, and I'm not sure I love it. I I don't know if it's out of place for me. What do you think? Um, I do a psychological profile for clients too, uh -huh. and I'll ask what kind of things, um, like for all of us, either it makes yeah. you uneasy to have more things out, or uh -huh. it's a mental clutter, or sometimes it's soothing. So that's one of those things I ask clients, do you feel good seeing your bowl of potatoes or canned goods? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we are... Or your mixer out makes you think of happy birthdays. Or yes, I mean by virtue of our <laughs> by virtue of of our certifications, I think we should be able to do some therapy, don't you? We've talked about that before, Susan. Absolutely, should yeah. be another certification. Def and saving marriages, of course. There's that one. Saving marriages, absolutely. Yep, yep. So, and then there's another one. Let's see, what do we have here? Same thing, but looking at it at a different angle. Mm -hmm. This was actually a shot of a kitchen that I took in uh, Copenhagen. Ah, and lovely. I'm doing a white and wood mix. Thanks for the inspiration. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm all over that. Love it. Now, here's one that I saw in Milan. Kind of, um, oh, yeah. you know, uh, a little industrial maybe. Uh, you know, and then there's, I'm not sure if it fits there either. It's just kind of there. Uh, I might have put it someplace else. What do you think? Susan, how many European kitchens do you see with slicers out? Right? Oh, and uh, that's right. Just part of, you know, You're right in Germany, especially. So again, that's one of those things that clients, and oftentimes if there's a family of kids using it, it doesn't always get cleaned up really well. So. <laughs> That's true. Sometimes that's it away. Now here is a a big that's island true. with a rack underneath. I mean, it could be designed so that the uh, mixer is tall enough. But I love this look. I like it. It has more. Seen, uh, again, with kids in the in the mix, uh, you yeah. go over there, start setting the table on the other side of the island. Uh, other things can be happening on the on the other side. Uh huh. And yeah. that's always kind of a nice mix. People get concerned about it being dirty and dusted. Obviously, it's the ones you use every day. Right, right. Now, um, Chef, can you tell me if you can see these images? I Put can. these images up? Okay. Are you ready to go on, or should we go through? Well, Keep I'm going. ready to go to the next one. I have the okay, because I have, I have more images, so we'll just pick it up again. Yep, we're going to take another little break when I have to clean out my bowl there. So... Uh, Let's get started, and I, I just have to grab some cheese real quick for this one. And a different kind of cheese. Well, I'm going to use gorgonzola in this. Oh, yeah. my other favorite. Okay, so yeah. what I'm going to make now is I'm going to make an arugula pesto, and again, it could be exactly what we made the way we made it before, um, just using you know Romano cheese. I'm just going to make it a little different. Now I have baby arugula here. Whenever I make something. Uh, there's going to be a uh, pesto or this kind of a combination of herbs or greens. I always try to get the smaller, the baby greens for it because they're going to give you that flavor profile without being 
uh, over, uh, you know, overpowering again, or without as much bitterness as they start to get older. So this arugula is going to be wonderful. And I'm going to put that in. Yeah, I always try to get baby arugula too. It's just, I don't it's, know. It's just great. It's good on sandwiches. Yeah. It's good in salads. Uh, I, I like it on pizza. Um, you know, after the pizza comes out of the oven, of course, then you put some on with some of your other uh -huh. ingredients. So we're going to do this. Nice. I haven't made that before, arugula pesto. Okay, I have to broaden my repertoire. So again, we're just pulsing it down. How much of the stem do you leave, Chef Dennis? I'm sorry? How much of the stem do you just... On the baby arugula, I just, it was organic. And sure. I, I left it the way they, they gave it to me. Um, generally on a, on a parsley or basil, I try to remove as much of the stem as you can. Uh, but again, I'm not going to knock myself out pulling each leaf off of it all the time, too. In a restaurant, I have people that would do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so well, you know, it depends on how much my OCD kicks in that day. Yeah. Well, my OCD never quite kicks in that much. Yeah, other things it does, but on this Oh, one. you are too, Rhonda? Me too, all the way. Uh, now, look how much time I've spent, you know. So I really wonder in something like this with the blender, how much of that can just, or if that's considered a real no-no, does it add any? Well, I would not. It's going to get, um, you're going to get the strings in it. Uh, you're going to get a little yeah. coarseness of the fiber in it. Uh, so I would stay away from the stem. Don't be that lazy, right? Yeah, well, you know, you, you don't have to be crazy about it. Uh, like I used to actually take my parsley and I'd hold it upside down and I'd carve it off with a knife. Yeah, you know, exactly. Good shortcut. Thank yeah. You. And with, you know, without going nuts, and parsley's not that expensive. That, you know, <laughs> I could go buy another bunch if I if I lose part of it. Um, basil's a little easier to do because the leaves are bigger, so you don't mind plucking them. Or mm -hmm. you know, it's a little easier to see that because they have really big fat stems, so you know they're they're easy to pull out too. But arugula, it's just the leaves. Uh, if you're going to use baby kale, it's the same thing. It's just the leaves, baby spinach. You know, any, anything along those lines. So, and that's the only thing that gives me green thumbs because I don't have green thumbs. <laughs> it's off all of the, that's the only thing. Good so we, have, we have the uh, arugula in here. And now instead of, I'm going to add a little piece of garlic, but instead of the pine nuts, I have some pistachios. And they're salted pistachios. So I'm, I'm getting a different flavor profile on this. I'm telling you, I need a spreadsheet. Spreadsheet starting. All right, now I'm going to put the cheese in. I'm going to do this a little backwards, so I'm going to start adding some oil in now. So why are you doing it backwards? Well, because the cheese is going to really gum it up a little bit. Okay. So this is adding a little lubricant before the cheese goes in. Yeah. Keep it. Oh, right, I forgot it's gorgonzola. That's right. That's right. And again, enough oil so it starts to come off the wall. And this is going to be a little more, I didn't grind the pistachios down quite as much because, again, I'm going for a little bit of a different kind of a pesto. So they're, if they're a little bit bigger bites than the pine nuts would have been. Uh, again, if you want to make this and just keep it more standard, you can use, you can use uh, pine nuts in it or walnuts in it. Now, so would, get, would you use that? Would you also use that pesto for on pasta, or would yeah. you use that on different dishes? You use it on pasta. You can use it on uh, any other dish you wanted to. Just use it any way you would normally use pesto. It's again up to you on how you want to use it and what flavors. Now the only thing different now. This is not a really good gorgonzola. I, I had a piece in here and it, had not, it was not good anymore. So I had to grab something really quick and I didn't have time to go to Whole Foods for some good gorgonzola. So this is gorgonzola crumbs. You know, Chef, one of my favorite gorgonzola type cheeses is Danish blue. Do you know oh, Danish yeah. blue? I love blue cheese. Yep. Uh, my favorite gorgonzola is a mountain picante. Uh, we started getting that down here and that's got a little bit more of a sharpness to it. Because uh, for years I got this standard wheel, I forget the brand name, but it was a blue 
aluminum wrapper on it, and that's all the only gorgonzola I ever saw in my whole life. And then I started finding some really good ones, and the the mountain picante was just wonderful. And then there's a a dolce, which is really sweet, but it's a creamy uh, gorgonzola, and that is so good to put on bread, and it's got uh, it's still got a nice kick to it. But you know, you know what I could see this for. I could see this as a spread for um, open face sandwiches. Yep, it would be good for that because it would yeah. give you the, the arugula, the nuttiness. So I'm just going to pulse this a little. Sounds like a Scandinavian. Yeah. How did you guess? That's right. I so, mean, it's a, it's the simplest thing to make open face sandwiches, and they're so festive and dressy. So you can see yeah. that the cheese did make its way in very well. It did blend in. Nice. So that's, uh, we put that in last. So that's it for there, and that's an arugula pesto. And I'm going to show you some applications for everything in just a little bit. But you said there were some questions too? Yes, I have some. I We have some good questions. Uh, okay, let's see. Coach G. Moore mm -hmm. says, stems have the great taste. What do you think about the taste of stems? Well, again, there, there's flavor in them. There's flavor in everything. There's no reason to throw everything away. But it depends what you're using it for. If it's in a salad, you know, I might leave more stems on it because it's going to have more fiber um, to it, to what you're eating, and it's going to give you more of a different mouthfeel. But in something like pesto, you know, you, you, again, you can grind them up. If you have a nice sharp blade, you can. And it's all a matter, you know, what you like. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Kim Baltman says, beautiful lines and lighting on the first two kitchens. The third one looks like a restaurant kitchen. That third one was a big display in Milan, and that was a booth in Milan. It was the Electrolux booth, and it was just amazing. It was just stunning. So, yes, a lot of the lines uh, that I saw in Milan, they were very clean. They were very, very great. They were, you know, it was a sort of horizontal uh, sort of feeling and um, very, very... The asymmetric cutaways in the shelves, Susan, were wonderful. That, that sliced half in. Yes. Yes. And not to line those up, but that's really adding architectural stacking interest there. There was so much, so much architectural interest and so much of a, uh, so much of a flow, um, which it, it was so much of a built-in sort of look. And Carmen Mandich says, which is interesting. I use a small old coffee bean grinder used for espresso coffee to chop nuts, garlic, etc. Well, that's interesting. I haven't heard that before. Yeah, you could use one. It's it's going to do the same job. The whole problem with something like that, if it was like one of the newer style, it would be cleaning it. Uh, but if it's an older style and even a hand grinder, you know, absolutely. Yeah, I wonder if it flavors the coffee at all. Well, I don't think she uses it for coffee, too. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, she she oh, because she said it's old, of course. Boy, yes, yeah, see? <laughs> I told you, I said on one of my posts, I'm going to ask questions anywhere from dumb to smart. Well, so, I wasn't dumb. That was just... Well, it wasn't smart. Just okay. missed it. I'm going to show you uh, one of my applications for the first pesto we made. And I have some pasta... Right out of the right out of the pot. Okay, so I'm going to put this in here, and this is how Lisa loves it the best. Put in a spoon of pesto in here, and you can do this with any of the pestos. But while it's hot, you're just going to mix this all around. Get a nice, and again, depends. And I can use a little bit heavier, so it looks a little a little heavier on this than normal because I had some basil in it, I mean uh, parsley in it, which cut back the flavor profiles a little bit. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, a little bit of liquid from the pasta at all? No, I didn't need it. it was, you know, it's just, it's coming out of the pot nice and hot, and uh, it's just loaded. So, Ironically, I did a pesto and pasta twice last week, and a little bit on the dry side. Good tip, Susan. I should have uh, doing some of the greens, but also some of the roasted tomato pestos. Oh, nice. About that later. But you can see you know, the nice oil on it. There's a nice sheen on it. If you felt it needed a little bit, now that, again, this is the time you bring out your really good olive oil. You know, you could just drizzle 
a little bit of some really good nutty olive oil on it. That's what I mean. Sprinkle it with a little more cheese. And if you want a little crushed oh, yeah. red pepper on it or something. But it doesn't get fresher than this. <laughs> this this speaks springtime. This and where's where's Lisa? Is she just right off the uh <laughs> she's got to come and grab it? She's on the porch. But uh but this also served with some grilled vegetables. Okay, if you wanna if you wanna do something, you set up a nice big platter, have this all ready, grill your vegetables or roast them ahead of time, let them be room temperature, and then serve this with a nice plate of uh, grilled or roasted vegetables. Uh, if you want to grill some chicken or shrimp, I mean, but by itself, this is wonderful. This is just a really such a pretty good. presentment. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is, I mean, that's that's a great way to eat. So any of the pestas, you know, just get those pasta right out of the water, toss them, sit down, and enjoy. It looks absolutely delicious. Tell yep. me, uh, tell me something. I'm, I like to make ratatouille mm -hmm. in the summer. I love ratatouille. I I, I love it. Would you? Would you? Think about adding pesto to ratatouille. It just occurred to me. You could, but you're gonna change the flavor of those wonder. Oh, you're, do you make a liquid ratatouille? I just put all the vegetables in you and you do a pot. I do a pot. Okay. Uh, and then just cook them for a couple of hours. I don't think you would want to use pesto in it because it would be a waste of the pesto because what you want to put in is the basil and some of your other seasonings. If you're going to go to the trouble and expense to make a nice pesto, putting it into that isn't really going to be a good use for it um, because it's going to cook down. I make a Mediterranean ratatouille, which is a roasted one, and I use all different kinds of herbs in it when it's roasting, and it has tomatoes in it, but it's not a sauced one at all. It's a dry one. This old, uh, Actually, an old chef from Norway taught me how to make this. It was amazing. Uh, he had made it. He had cooked for presidents and kings, and this was something he had learned. And he used to make a lot when he worked on cruise lines, and it was a Mediterranean version of it. And uh, it was just wonderful. And I have never made a potted uh, rat tattooy since that's really cooked down because it just becomes. I mean, it's a melange of flavors. Yes. Yes. Uh, when you roast them, everything still has its own unique flavor. Uh, it, it's just wonderful that yeah, way. Yeah, no, when I make it, it's one big mush, but it is delicious. So <laughs> our, we have to watch our time, Chef, so uh, I'm keeping you on track. So you have another. Yeah, come on. Of course she's going to take it. Oh, uh, she says she's not hungry now. Oh, she's yeah. not hungry. No, you don't have to. I'll take it. Well, yeah, I'll really. Go later. She's not going on camera. No, she's not going on camera. Ha, <laughs> ha. Uh, that'll be gone in a few minutes. Uh, yeah, let's let's move on. So why don't you guys chat a little bit while I clean okay. up the, uh, the food processor and we'll move on to our last one. Sounds good. So, so yeah. I have a quick question for you. Sure. If and the time is right, um, there was a question that popped up. Uh, as we're talking about great food combinations and ways to prepare and serve, there was a question about some good Pinot, Pinot Noirs out of or Oregon. Oh, yeah, that's your yeah, turn, when, so tell us. Um, in Portland, we can go about one hour we're at the coast and another hour we're in the mountains. So we also have in between there some really nice um, wine country. Um, so there's uh, Eminent Domain, which is a ribbon ridge, uh, has been great, Masson. Um, and also just uh, Chapter 24, Purple Hands, do you love that name, Purple Hands? Is another Oregon one here, and um, Raptor Ridge, and I'm not sure about availability for those nationally. And you're, you know, and of course, yeah. Well, we have it on. We, we have it on tape now, so we can always come back and really uh, reasonably priced. I think a, a King Estate, and then Argyle, also out of the Willamette Valley. It's another very nice um, Pinot Noir, and I love. Cooper Mountain is one of my favorites, um, and Saint Innocent. So oh. there's, a, there's a short list, long list, uh, and Monte Ferro. But great, great, thank you. you. Well, thank Pinot Noir you. is one of Lisa's favorite wines, so if any of you Oregon producers would like to send us some, I'll be yeah. happy to review them. <laughs> yes, there we go. <laughs> let's look. Like, let's take a look at another couple of kitchens. Uh, everyone seems to love the kitchens. Yeah. 
So now this one, Rhonda, is interesting. Take a look at this. Uh, this was in Milan, and this is an island, and at the end of an island is this, uh, you know, sort of bright blue uh, open shelving piece. Now, would you put a, I'm not so sure I put a KitchenAid mixer in this Susan, fabulous, glamorous area. Susan, we can't really see it. You have like three of them up there. Oh, okay. I have three of them up Help there. Help me, Rhonda. <laughs> okay. You had, you had three of the same picture across there. I don't know if you got the right screen share on that. But while you're doing that, Susan, I can answer that real quickly in that um, you you'll go. see, we've seen a lot of the color introductions as opposed to white stainless and making them disappear. We've yes. also seen some that are punching up the color. So uh, again, like anything, psychological profiling for the client. If you want to um, do a personality mixer, there's all kinds of colors available now, unlike any other time. I know. Before. That's definitely, that's, that's absolutely great. Open, yep, and open shelving. I saw open shelving everywhere. I don't think that's going away anytime soon. And of course, that's uh, you know that's that's conducive to uh, well actually there is a uh, mixer right here so it's a it's good to have a home it's good to have a home for the appliances I mean that's what you have to plan for in advance and sometimes it's a process now also in Milan I saw lots of concealed uh, sort of separate areas where the doors open and they close and then the mess is confined uh, and you know, so that's that's been a trend for a couple of years, wouldn't you say? I also do a lot with downsizing because absolutely, if we look at sociologically and economically, we've been downsizing with spaces. So we're doing a lot in a small space. And there's oftentimes that, I call it, um, I do what I call um, almost like robotic changes that can happen in spaces. Now you see it, now you don't. Transformers, basically. Yep. Yeah, exactly. That's funny because I call it I call it a similar thing. I call it flexible living. Yeah. Living in a flexible way is that rules. It My son thinks it's a kick that I've uh, borrowed from his era of transformer designs now, but uh, changing huh. things. But the appliances like this can either you know pop up or disappear. And I know that you've got some other great suggestions. Yes, I have that too. Here's another one, which again, this is a concealed sort of uh, area, which we have some ovens below, and then we have the mixer on top. So that that is that was very popular in Milan. Here's uh, a kitchen just with a uh, mixer on the countertop, basic countertop. The only thing about that is it does attract dust. It gets so dusty. And here's another one too. It fits, you know, a the useful items and decorative items always work very well together. This I love, Rhonda. Every day. I did one recently very similar to this with that bottom shelf. Love Just it. Slide it in, slide it out. Love and it. In fact, in their case, we kind of embraced the era. We did. A, we found a vintage-looking toaster and a vintage-looking mixer. Yes. Yeah. Just rolled with it. Yes, it's just so functional and it's so beautiful too. Here's a. Wow. Uh, you know, bigger pantry slash open shelving area where, you know, the question is, do you want to pick up the heavy KitchenAid mixer and bring it across, you know, four feet over? Some people don't care. Um, you know, some people do. Here's a very formal I'm kitchen. Glad, glad you mentioned that because also as a certified agent and place specialist, and that does not mean that we are, you know, have one foot on, a, on the banana peel and one in the grave. It's a matter of having kids at whatever age we're having them cook in the kitchen, do you want them schlepping the mixer over or for some of us carpal tunnel, it doesn't mean that we are, you know, you know, handicapped in many, many ways, but just lifting the mixers or appliances, safety and ease. And you know, you're you're right. It's for all ages. I'm also CAP certified. Um, so yeah. the yeah. you know, it's for generations. It's it's common sense and to what you're saying, it can be beautiful and ergonomic at the same time. Great. So yeah, you're are we ready to move on. Okay, sure. Right. Let's let's take uh, one last pesto to make because we're we're starting to run a little close on time. And this is sun dried tomato, so this is going to be a little different than Yay. making something uh, with greens because we're going to use the sun dried tomato to make this instead. So I have reconstituted these, and I'm going to squeeze out some of the juice as much as I can. And I, I didn't drain them because I hate to throw this juice away. 
because I'll use it in other sauces or in other dishes, and it's got a nice flavor to it. So this is going to be a little wetter. I'm probably not going to use anywhere near as much oil for it, but I want it to be a little bit more of a paste. So I've got these in here, and we're going to... And those were the dry. Those yep, were the dry were. that you... Oh, okay. Oh. Do you remember, Rhonda, when sun-dried tomatoes were so big? What was it, about 10, 15 yeah. years ago? Mm -hmm. I'm from the Midwest originally, so we canned and dried quite a bit, but that was considered fairly... Uh, upscale that we hadn't right, yeah, right. Add a little bit of oil to it now because I wanted to paste a little bit more before I add alright that's a little better now we're going to put in our pine nuts I mean what do you think about that pesto with uh, you know, on a on a platter with mozzarella and basil leaves. Sure, you could put it on for bruschetta. You could use it as yeah. a topping on bruschetta. Uh, you could use it on any meats and seafood. So I've got my garlic and my pine nuts. Grind that up. This is going to be a little. You have to watch it a little more because consistency of it. You probably could have almost put everything in together at the same time. <laughs> Garlic's not wanting to go. Well, do you want the tomatoes to be a little chunky? Or do you want it a puree? What's that? Do you want the tomatoes to have any kind of chunkiness to them, or do you want it a strict puree? No, I want it to be more of a puree. Susan, you have me thinking about the open face sandwiches. My friend is coming from Norway next week. Oh, you need to do it. And we're having a big party. Um, so, think about some other open face. There's so many things you can do. There's greens, like watercress, you can put on it, and uh, you know, cold cuts, and salmon, or uh, so many things. Yeah. Look at Pinterest, actually. You can find some there. Now we're going to hit some oil. Okay. It up a little. And again, you want to see it start to pull away from the side a little. And done. All right, so now we have this beautiful red color and you know nice. if, there are, if there are a few bits in it you know it's no harm no foul it's fine we have okay. this that is gorgeous that is just and it looks so fresh and it's I, I love the fresh and the flavor of it is fresh. just outrageous uh, that right. benchmark you said if a little bit of oil is added it wants to pull away from the side a little bit that's that's one good sign to look for right yes with any pestos it yes. starts to pull away you know you've had enough oil in it. Otherwise, because again, you don't want it to be an oily mess, sure. but you want it to be liquid enough and pliable enough that you can use it. That's why no, I said with, Good tip. With the pasta dish that I did do, like I said, it really wasn't dry because there was enough oil in the uh, pesto to keep it from drying out. And again, though, but if you want to add a little more, you always can. Now what will you do? Will you, can you freeze these? I mean, I know I've I've always frozen pesto genovese. Yeah, you can freeze them if they last that long. Um, and how long will they last in the refrigerator? They'll last a couple weeks. The, uh, the one thing you'll see more than anything with the green ones is they'll start to darken a little bit. And you just want to pull away some of the dark, like even with this. It's darkening just sitting out here. As you move it away, you get that beautiful green color again. Nice. That is just beautiful. What do you think, Rhonda? Perfect. Love it. Real quick, we have a couple applications for it, too, if you'd like to see. And I have just what I was hoping for. Let me just show you how I would use some of it. I was going to ask you about proteins. <laughs> It was a stump the chef, but you beat me to it. 
So I've got some chicken here, and let me grab another plate. I was actually going to ask you if you could marinate it. Yes, huh. absolutely. I haven't done that before, but as I was thinking about it. And you really wouldn't need to marinate it in the traditional sense of marinade. Let's say I wanted to marinate it. I'll take one of these, and I wanted to use my basil pesto. All right, now I'm not going to. I'm going to use my hand because I don't want to touch. I don't want to use this. Yeah, well, that's nothing unusual, Chef. Yeah, but just like if I was doing this, and I just want to rub it in really okay. well. All right, and get a nice layer. Oh my! I'm totally going to do that. Oh yeah! Oh totally yeah! Totally going to do that. I don't know if you can see it with this camera. Let me change the cameras. Well, yeah, perfect. Good, good, good. But all right, so this would be one way. Now, when you talked about marinating, you know, I might just hit it with just a little bit more oil. I might do four or five breasts this way or thighs or whatever you wanted to use. Then wrap them up or put them in a bag, put them in a bowl, and put them away. That's your marinating. It doesn't have to be in a ton of liquid. How right. long How long can you marinate it for? Uh, the longer you marinate it, the more the flavor is going to infuse. I don't think I would want this to marinate overnight, although it probably could, but probably about four hours. Okay. I'm having a, a party on Saturday, and I think I'm going to uh, – I'm doing skewers. <laughs> I think I'm going to do that, chicken, you know, chunks marinated in um, pesto on the sk put on other skewers. Nice. Okay. So now we're going to add, we're going to take our pesto. Oh. Instead of, it can be the green one. I'm just using this one. Yeah. But instead of doing the marination, now, you could also add, like, if you wanted to really change things up, you could take a little... Uh, capicola or maybe a little prosciutto or another meat that you like and put it down on top of this layer of, of uh, pesto that you're doing. I mean, you could even go as far as to do a two-color one. Put a basil. Oh, cool. All right, now I'm going to take it and I'm going to roll it. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to put it in my breadcrumbs. Oh, no. Just breadcrumbs. Now, you might want to toothpick this because otherwise it's liable. If you're not really careful, it's liable to come out. But this is – then I'm going to take this. This can be made up ahead of time in the morning uh, without the breadcrumbs and then just breadcrumb them before you go to cook them. Now, I'm just going to saute these gently to get a little color to them finish them in the oven. Mm -hmm. so in the oven. Nice. That oh, that surprised it. me. I didn't expect you. I didn't know you were going to do that. That's cool. So this is another way. So you could use any of these pastas that we made to do something like this. You could do the same thing with flounder or tilapia. Okay. Just put a nice coat. If you want to put a piece of cheese down first, you know, play with it. Do what you want with it. But these are your flavors to really enhance what you're making. So that's another way. Now, the other thing I wanted to show is, like, we have some shrimp. Now, you talked about barbecuing or grilling. Now, I want to take, well, I'm going to do some of them. I'm going to take my pesto, and I'm just going to really rub them up really well. And I might, with this, I might take a little crushed red pepper. Mm. I mean, I you know, this is a show where we need to do a spreadsheet because there's like a hundred different variations of how to use pesto. Absolutely. You know, while, while you're uh, tossing there, you know, as again from Portland and Oregon area, a lot of salmon, always thinking about 110 ways to do salmon. Yep. Um, I'm just never thinking. Salmon, especially the arugula one with the pistachios. There you, you go. Yeah. You can put a little bit more pistachio on the top of it. So this is another way to use shrimp. So let me move this out of the way. And then we have a few more shrimp left. So again, oh, same okay. thing. We have, we're going to take a little bit of the sun dried. I think you just can't stop. Well, this, this is all you can do. Keep with, going. You know, so I'm going to rub these down a little with these good too. Maybe put a little more cheese on them. And if I had a little fresh oregano, even to chop on them, 
And now I'm going to let these sit for a while. A bit of oil. Uh huh. You've so inspired me. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to introduce a pesto donut at Voodoo Donuts here. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But now so you, you grill perfect these. Perfect for Portlandia. You grill these up, and side by side, you have some oh, red green shrimp. Beautiful. Just perfect. Yep. So this is just to show you some of the things you can do with these pestos that we made. That's. I mean, this this was inspiring. I can't believe all the things: the protein, the marinating, the open face sandwiches, the everything, and then a little pasta too. Oh, you know what's a really good one too? Is a grilled cheese with some pesto uh, on oh, the bread when you toast it, and do some tomatoes and do like a caprese grilled cheese. I think it's lunchtime now. <laughs> I I think it is. Right. So, Rhonda, tell us where where can everyone find you online on your social channels and you bet I'm online. Um, again, it's, it's Rhonda with an H, just like uh, the Beach Boys spelled it. Yes. Uh, remember, help me, Rhonda. I also do services like that where you can do uh, either whole house, just kitchen or bath, or maybe just a few questions, sort of like a stump the designer. Yeah. Your own personal HGTV time if you want. I've been doing that a lot. Um. So that can be found on uh, my website, but also I have a profile on House and a lot of conversations we jump in and out of on House. So. Yeah, no, that's that's a tremendous uh, tremendous uh, platform. Okay, Chef. Well, I mean, you out you outdid yourself this time oh. around. Thank you. Well, you inspired me with this when you started talking about pestos last week. And uh, I'm looking forward to next week's show too, because we're going to do, we're you know it's summertime, and uh, Susan told me says you know why don't we do more items that we can grill, or you know pretend to grill inside if you have a grill pan, and that's pretty much what we're going to be doing, because I'm not going to traipse outside as the summer gets really really hot. Oh yeah. Chef Dennis isn't going outside to grill, <laughs> so uh, that we'll leave that for winter. But we're going to give you some ideas on uh, some things you can make, some really easy, flavorful skewers. Uh, that we can use some uh, different proteins with. So we'll have that for you next week. I'm excited about that. That's and exactly what I'm making this coming weekend. I'm doing a bunch of skewers. I'm putting all kinds of things in it. So we'll compare notes. Absolutely. And Rhonda, thank you so much for uh, thank joining you. us. Thank you for inviting me. It was wonderful. Yep. And see. anything else, Chef? We'll see everyone next week. Yeah, we'll see you all next week. And thanks so much for stopping by. Bye. Bye-bye.